So, hello everybody. Welcome to Toulouse. Welcome to USAR. So before I start, I must tell you that everyone in the organization committee thinks that I am able to make a decent speech for the opening session. So that would be very kind and very helpful for my reputation if you could also applaud at the end. And maybe, like you've done, laugh a little bit at my jokes. Thank you. <laughs> so we have been working on the organization of USAR 2019 for more than two years and a half now. And everything has started just after we held the French meeting of our users right here in Toulouse in 2016. So we were celebrating the success of the conference in a nice restaurant, as usual. And someone from the team suggested that it was time for us to try something bigger, like user. So I don't know if it was meant as a joke, but we actually took, uh, contacted the Har Foundation, and we were very honored that they let us organize the conference. It was the beginning of a huge amount of work for all of us, and we have done our very best to make the conference enjoyable for everyone. As a side note, As a side note, I must also say that it was the last time I will ever make a professional decision after a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> so more seriously, what motivated us all in the organization of user was a common gratitude toward the whole community for making our daily work easier by creating tools and helping us develop and share our own. We are also very grateful to it for being so inclusive and supportive. In short, organizing user was just for us a way to give something back. So of course, the coordination of such a big event would not have been possible without the support of our institute and of the French scientific community. We first want to thank the Toulouse School of Economics who managed the conference budget. We thank also the National Institute of Agricultural Research and the Mathematics Institute of Toulouse. We want to thank the French Statistical Association who helped us organize, which helped us organize a data fund. In addition, we want to thank four research groups, BIM, Madix, Mascotnum, and Statistics and Health, who organized four poster prizes. Finally, we want to thank AMIES, the French Ma Agency for Mathematics in Industry, who helped us with the employer-employee meeting. Our sponsors were critical for the success of the conference by providing the necessary funding. We first want to thank the Har Consortium, who, who provided the means to record all talk and live stream all keynote sessions. Thanks to our over platinum sponsor, Deloitte, Région Occitanie, and Heart Studio. We want to thank our gold sponsor, Habus, Fincar, Toulouse Metropole, and the City of Toulouse, and our silver sponsor, EDF, L'Oréal, Open Analytics, Plural Site, and Safran. Finally, we want to thank the many bronze, violet, and media sponsors whose support was critical for the success of the conference. As we say in France, many little streams make big rivers. So the organization committee is composed of 12 enthusiastic members and 23 students. In addition, in addition to us, Ever Turner has provided a huge support and made the link with the Har Foundation. In addition to English, we can speak a few other languages, including French. So I am the one speaking French, in case you were wondering. We can also speak German, Italian, Spanish, Castillon, Dutch, Vietnamese, and Farsi. You can contact us if you want to speak in one of those languages or if you need any assistance. You can also contact us using our Twitter account and our email. The members of the organization committees are identified by a 
pink armband, so I don't have mine because I never follow the rules. But because pink is, Toulouse is often called the pink city, la ville rose en Toulousain. And her bodies are identified with blue armbands. They are here to help anybody that needs it, included company during social times or introductions to others. The members, the members of the organization committee also have pink, uh, purple band on their name tags, and sponsors have red band on their name tags. We, we want the conference to be an enjoyable experience for everyone. You have all accepted our code of conduct, so please respect it, respect it be kind and supportive to each other. Sébastien and Noah are here to make sure that everyone follows the code of conduct. If you want to report a violation of the code of conduct, please reach out to them or to any of the organizers of the, of the Harbodies. You can also contact us using our email, coc at user2019.fr. We have dedicated people for specific topics. So, for instance, Anne is in charge of the meals. Aurore is your main contact if you are a sponsor. Christophe is in charge of the technical issues with the conference material and of the childcare. There's no relation between the two topics. And Thibault is in charge of the issues with registration and is your main contact with Edgar if you are a keynote speaker, a tutor, or a scholarship recipient. We have a few side meetings or organized in parallel of the conference. Uh, sorry, please, no music. Um, so practical information can be found in the conference booklet. So we want you to have your name tag visible at all time. Meals and coffee breaks are served in three different places in the conference center, but special dietary meals are only served in Caravel 1. For keynote sessions, questions to keynotes may only be, be asked using slide.do. If you want to ask a question during the keynote session, please go to the slide.do website and enter the conference code user 2019. You can ask questions there or uh, vote for questions of others during the session. If you have asked a certificate of attendance, it will be sent automatically to you after the conference by email. Few, uh, for speakers, please note that all talks are being recorded and that they will be published online on the Hawk Consortium YouTube channel. If you do not want your talk to be put on the internet, please contact us as soon as possible. We also ask that you put your slides on the conference computers during a break before your session. Please be aware that uh, our computers are Windows uh, operating system, so make sure that your US, USB drives are, are formatted accordingly. Finally, if you have HTML slides that run, on, that run uh, remotely, you can send us the link and we will publish them online if you wish. Finally, uh, for speakers of Flash Posters presentation, you have a seat reserved with your name in the first rows on the, of the conference room during your session. Please go to this room before the end of your session of your coffee break of, Tuesday, of Thursday afternoon, and you will be explained how the session is organized. So we have a few side meetings organized in parallel of the conference, as I said before. During lunch times, we have a Herleni meeting today in Foyer Airbus on the second floor, and to, tomorrow you will have a employer employee meeting uh, in Foyer Airbus on the third floor. The gala dinner is organized tonight, and buses will start from the conference center just after the end of the, the, end of the, of the talks. Check your booklet and, the, and our website for more information. The riot workshop is organized tomorrow in Dora on the third floor, and the poster session is also organized tomorrow at 6 p.m., uh, and a cocktail will be served during that session. We wanted to give our conference a sustainable flavor, so we will try to estimate the carbon footprint of the conference. Please help us doing so by filling the survey at this uh, URL. You can also find the link on Twitter and on our website. 
we will publish the results and try to use it, if possible, to offset a bit our carbon footprint by a donation to a dedicated association. We thank Jérôme Mariette for his support for this project. Finally, we wanted to welcome you with something special from us. So we have invited the band Multa Kasawi to give a short musical performance during the opening session and a longer one during the gala dinner tonight. The band's name means Meat and Peace and its musical director, Sally Halawi, creates a music that mixes influences from Southwestern Europe, so Occitanie and Spain, for instance, with the Moroccan traditional music. It perfectly reflects the spirit of Toulouse, which has welcomed many Spanish refugees during, during the Civil War and is still today strongly connected to Spain and North Africa. We had wished, we had hoped that our country would express the same welcoming spirit. However, the recent events prove that it is not the case. Several participants have been held back at the French border in the last days, which we regret and strongly condemn. For us, it is a shame and a sadness. I hope that, however, you will enjoy the music that we offer avec plaisir as we sing Toulouse. Thank you. Yeah. 
llame maestro y el camino del amor que se vaya elevando mi alma y mi corazón.
Merci. Merci. Andrea Salabas, your side. Au violon, Sabrina, Algeria. Kiko Ruiz, Espagne. Ingrid Ponquin, France. Et Serena de Sousa, Espagne. Merci. Ali Alaoui. From first, from Morocco, direction. Good morning. This is uh, one of the more <laughs> difficult to navigate transitions that I've <laughs> been asked to do in a while, but I am so happy to be here at USR and um, here with the R community. And I'm really excited to introduce um, a few of the speakers that we're going to be hearing from uh, today. So the first um, speaker that we're going to hear from today um, is Joe Reichert, who's going to be uh, sharing a little bit about the R Consortium and the work of the R Consortium that it does in um, and wh who they are, what they do, and how they support our community. So, um, Joe, let's have you come up, and we will. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, that was a hard act to follow. Uh, I have been rendered speechless. So. so I'm very happy to be here today, and I wish to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the R Consortium. So we've been at it for now. Oh. Oh. We've been operating now for, this is our fourth year. And um, oh well. So the consortium is an association of uh, business enterprises and other institutions um, operating as a nonprofit for the purpose of uh, promoting and advancing the R language, uh, supporting the R community and the R foundation. And um, what you can see here is the current list of members. There are 12 companies up there, along with the, um, the R Foundation, and we're very grateful uh, for their membership. So this slide here is meant to indicate, um, it's a cartoon that indicates the relationship of the, the consortium to the business community, really. Uh, and what we do, as I see it, is provide a way for enterprises to become part of the R community by contributing to the community. And we have these goals, um, as you can see, to support the growth of R, to advance R in enterprise scale environments, and to foster collaboration. So what we'd very much like to do is to be able to help people collaborate both at the company level and at an individual level. As it is, there are three ways that we, um, we operate right now. Um, we sponsor events, we fund projects, and uh, we nurture what are called working groups. And, and I'll be speaking about them in particular later on this week. So, so far this year, we have um, we have uh, granted about 60K in sponsorships to conferences, large and small. So you see a mixture of them here. We have two vehicles for doing that. We have a um, user group and small conference support program that gives out grants for um, 
up to $1,000. And if you're interested in, in starting an event or funding, you need funding for that kind of event, uh, you can apply on the, our consortium webpage. We also give considerably larger grants, and to do that, you should contact the um, uh, members of the R Consortium oh, directly. So we'd be very happy to talk with you about the possibility of sponsoring a large event. Over um, the past um, four years now, or three and a half years, we have um, funded almost well, a little more actually than a million dollars in grants. These going to the conferences, as I just mentioned, and also to funded projects um, where individuals or groups of individuals can apply uh, twice a year to have a, a project accepted by the consortium and funded. And right now we have three top level projects. Uh, these are uh, funded for three year three-year periods, and we have the R User Group Support Program, funding for Our Ladies, and funding for the R Hub Project fit in this category. Now what I want to show you here, I will not read these, but um, I'll turn the page slowly to give you an idea of the kind of work um, that we fund. Uh, our charter actually says that we should uh, support the infrastructure for the R community, and we take a broad view of infrastructure. So as you can see, there are some very technical projects and there are other projects that have to do with the community um, by funding the conferences or um, you can see here up in the corner, there's Saturday's events. Uh, we, do, um, we do some work with people who are producing documentation. So there's, there's many opportunities and we encourage you to think about how you might be able to participate and apply for one of these grants. We also have this idea of working groups, and uh, I'm not going to go into any detail here. I will speak uh, in some detail on Friday. But these are meant for, for people, a ways for people and corporations um, to come together for events that require collaboration and decision making and we can provide the locus and the support to make that happen. To be a member of an R Consortium working group, you do not have to work for a company that belongs to the R Consortium. So the heart of the pitch here is why should a company join the R Consortium? And I think this quote from Alan Betting of Genentech sums it up. Uh, we see R as the future of statistical analysis because of its flexibility and the strong, active community behind it. So it's because of all of you and the contributions you make, both technical and otherwise, um, that has made R a real force to be reckoned with in the, in the data science and community. And companies um, are beginning to appreciate that that they need to protect their investment by having the community and the R language strong for many years to come. So I'd like to close with just a, um, a call for your support. If you work for a company that is benefiting from the R language and that you think it could be engaged enough to become a member of the community, please do what you can to, to promote the idea. And on your personal level, um, there are many ways for you to participate, so please, we'd love to have you um, become active in the consortium. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, we have a little bit of time if anyone has a question for Joe about the um, about the R consortium. If you uh, have a question, you can speak up and I'll um, repeat it into the mic so that we can have it uh, recorded. Oh, did these come out? Uh, okay, if, if there is a question for about the R consortium. All right, well, thank you so much, Joe.
that was great to hear about because I know I'm a organizer of a local R user group in um, in my city and back home and the support of the R consortium for our local R user group has been great so it was wonderful to hear about the breadth and the depth of the work of this sponsor of uh, the R community in general and of this conference where we are in particular. Um, next on our agenda is our first keynote of USAR 2019. Um, for our keynotes um, this year at USAR, uh, we're going to be organizing questions on Slido. So you, we heard a little bit about it, but I'm just going to take a moment to explain it once more. So we are not going to be, if all goes well, we're not going to be asking for you to stand up and take a mic and speak a question. Instead, uh, go on your phone or on your laptop and uh, go to uh, uh, slido.com or sli.do and then enter the event code for our event, USAR. So the event code is USAR2019. It's case insensitive. And then in there, you can type a question if you have a question or you can upvote questions that other people have asked. So um, during the course of the keynote, you can um, type in questions. Ooh, sorry, you can type in talk with my hands apparently. You can type in questions as they come to you or during the question and answer period at the end you can type in questions as well and you can vote on the ones other people have um, have submitted. So during the question and answer period I will come up here and I will uh, read them so that they are recorded um, so that they're on the live stream and we can all share that experience together. All right, so our, um, our first keynote um, of the conference this year is uh, Julia Stewart Lowndes. Um, so Julia is going to be speaking about a topic that is important and relevant for, um, for all of us in here, about how to be more efficient and more impactful with our work using the R language. Her background is in uh, marine ecology, and I hear that there were squid involved at, at some point. Um, now she's a, a data scientist and a Mozilla fellow at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Thin Synthesis in the US. She's um, the founding director of OpenScapes and the science program lead of the Ocean Health Index. She's also the co-founder of um, Eco Data Science and Our Ladies Santa Barbara in California. And I am really looking forward to what she's going to be sharing with us today. So, um, so with that, thank you so much. So Julia, come on up and we will um, hear our first keynote this morning. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for this invitation. I'm a marine scientist, and R as a language and as a community has been game-changing for my science and for my life. So much so that over the past six years, I've been moving away from doing my own research so that I can pay forward what I've learned and focus on enabling other scientists to do better science in less time. Throughout this, I've learned several lessons, and I want to share them with everyone up front. These lessons are that open data science is a mindset, that teamwork starts with openness, and that to really be the most impactful, we need to harness the power of welcome. So I'm going to spend the whole talk building out these lessons, but I first want to tell you a bit about me and my experiences and what has driven these lessons. I'm often asked why a marine scientist would need to know R, so I want to make sure that you leave here knowing that marine scientists, as well as environmental scientists more broadly, work with data every single day to do our science, and it's critical that we are supported and learn how to work with data responsibly. So let me start off um, talking about when I was a graduate student in a marine research group, which we also call laboratories in the US. So I am a squid ecologist, um, which is why many of you might know me from my Twitter handle, Julie Squid. 
So this is me, and I'm holding a squid that is nearly as big as I am. We caught this squid at sea, and we're releasing it back into the ocean with a little electronic tag on it. And this tag turns this squid into a little oceanographer because it's gonna collect data along with the squid wherever it swims. The data we're collecting occurs at every single second, which means that I can actually see the squid breathe as it swims, since breathing and swimming is coupled with jet propulsion. So my whole uh, PhD research group focused on squid. We were interested in squid because it has huge ecological impacts since these animals eat a lot and grow quickly. And they also have huge economic impacts because we eat, there is such a high consumption rate of calamari globally. So in our lab, we focused on all different lines of research. We looked at ecology like I did, locomotion, camouflage, and early life development, among other things. So our research required us to work like a team, and we, worked, we did a lot of teamwork both at, um, both at sea and, on, and in the laboratory. Um, and we were a typical research group because we worked like a team about our scientific questions. And we're also a typical research group because we didn't act like a team when it came to data. Analyzing data was something that each of us were left to figure out on our own as individuals. Because in all of my education as a marine ecologist, I never learned computing or any kind of way to work responsibly with data. So for me, it was a really demoralizing and, and isolating experience to get that tag back that had traveled nearly a kilometer and a half deep with this squid swimming all over, and I could hold this data in my hand, but I could not analyze it because I didn't have the right skills. So it basically felt like this. This is Luke Skywalker after he, after he crashed his plane into the swamp of Dagobah. He's sitting there staring at a challenge that he cannot solve with the skill sets that he has. So it's super demoralizing and lonely. And if you imagine for a second that he did attempt to solve this problem with whatever ropes or pulleys he had on hand, it would not have been pretty, it wouldn't have been reproducible, and it probably wouldn't have gotten him to where he needed to be on time. But luckily, this isn't what happens to Luke. What happens is that he meets Yoda. And Yoda has a skill set that can solve Luke's challenge in a way that Luke never dreamed was possible. Yoda uses the Force. And this is gonna open up Luke's whole mind and world because he can see what's possible, he can learn from Yoda, and this will not only let him solve his current challenge, but it's gonna broaden his whole mind to the scope of challenges that he can take on in the future. But Luke doesn't go on to defeat the empire by himself. He has a whole community around him. And this community is powerful because it's diverse and because everyone has a diversity of backgrounds and expertise. So although not everyone is a Jedi, everyone contributes in really critical ways. So just to recap here, um, R is the force that enables scientists to do better science in less time. It empowers us to get our data out of the swamp and it empowers us to build off of this confidence and this experience and broaden the scope of the, of the scientific challenges that we can tackle, which for environmental scientists includes really critical topics like food security, disease transmission, and climate change. So for me, I didn't fully feel the power of R in graduate school. I felt it when I joined the research group where I am today, where we learned to work responsibly with data as a team. So the Ocean Health Index is a scientific endeavor to quantify the benefits and impacts of oceans around the world using the best available public data. It's being used by the United Nations and also by 20 different independent groups around the world interested in studying ocean health in their own waters. There's a lot of cool things to say about the Ocean Health Index, but what's relevant here is that we combine lots of data, we repeat our work annually, and we do it as a team. But we're marine scientists, so we were, never, we're, we were never taught how to work responsibly with data. So we found out the hard way that the default approaches that we took were not reproducible even by ourselves. 
And getting through this and, and moving past it involved quite a reckoning and a lot of soul searching. But we got through it and we knew we had a story to tell. We found our path to better science in less time using open data science tools. And for me, that means R and GitHub and friends. We share in this, um, in this publication, we share how these tools enabled us to be more reproducible and work faster each year as illustrated in this figure. So this shows how the circles get smaller through time, showing that it takes less time to do our work and also that it gets easier to reproduce and easier to collaborate with our future selves as individuals and our future selves as a team. So this let us focus, having, when it took less time each year, it let us focus on the, either the data, improving the data science side or the science side of our work. So we couldn't overhaul our, everything that we did at once, but incrementally we focused on pieces each year. So in 2013, we focused on making R and our studio the foundation of how we worked. And then we introduced Git and GitHub. And then we focused on introducing more tidy data principles. And then finally on communication, particularly with R Markdown. And ever since in 2017, we've been able to focus on training graduate students in the way we work and our whole workflow so that they can lead these assessments every year with less cost and less time. So having all this coding infrastructure in place is what enables those 20 countries around the world to use our science and our code to assess ocean health in their, in their, in their waters and the places they care about. But just like Luke, we were able to do this because of community. These communities in particular have been so transformative for our work. So many of you in this room and listening around the world have welcomed us and supported us and enabled us. And like I say, I've been paying it forward. I've been teaching with the carpentries and leading local communities like Eco Data Science and Our Ladies Santa Barbara. And this is how I ended up getting a fellowship with Mozilla. And yes, Mozilla is the Mozilla that you know from the Firefox browser. But they also have a broader mission to keep the internet a place for good. They do this by tackling misinformation, by privacy and security, and by focusing on open science. So that's where I came in. I spent the last year developing a program with Mozilla and NCs, which is the Ecology Center where I'm based. And the program is called OpenScapes. It's a mentorship program for research groups. And it's modeled after our experience with the Ocean Health Index which is now one of the most visible examples of what open data science can look like in an environmental context. So the program is modeled after the Ocean Health Index, both in the way the tools that we work with and in the way our team operates. So the main purpose of OpenScapes is to welcome and empower scientists as research groups to open data science and then to also increase the visibility and the value of open data science in an environmental context by amplifying these research groups as they engage. So it's focused around a, a mentorship group where I work with early career scientists and their labs. And the idea is for them to normalize open data science within their own research groups and then seed that change beyond. So this is the vision I see for environmental science, where the elements that environmental scientists are great at here on the left, like the theory and experimental design that goes into environmental science, as well as all of the data that we see in the landscape, is streamlined together with open data science and helps us communicate around environmental solutions. So I know this graphic in the middle looks familiar from R for Data Science, but notice that the data science components that look familiar are ringed by these communities and support that have been so critical for our Ocean Health Index team. So this is the vision I'm working towards with OpenScapes, and I'm really optimistic that we can do this because the first cohort of OpenScapes participants are well on their way after only five months. 
But this is the way it looks right now. Um, because like I've mentioned before, we rarely have formal training in coding or computing or data practices. So folks are left to learn on their own in pockets and are unsupported in the broader institutional levels with data practices. So helping, this com helping complete this picture is what drives my work now. And I wanna figure out how to best introduce open data science and teamwork into this picture. So I have found that scientists are often not aware of what tools are available to them, but that is just the very first sliver of the challenge. Because I think the real challenge is about the mindset around open data science and helping scientists feel included in open data science so that it can be not only part of their future, but part of their present. So the first lesson learned that we'll talk about is that open data science is a mindset. This involves expecting that there's a better way to work using data science. It involves building confidence and willingness to change your practices with open science. And it involves reimagining what what's possible with communication using the same tools that you use for your analyses. It can be really hard to expect there's a better way to work when you don't know what's possible and you don't see any examples in your own context. It's like how Luke would never have dreamed that the Force was available as a tool for him if he hadn't run into Obi-Wan and Yoda. When I was struggling with my squid data, I couldn't expect there was a better way because my challenges with data were so wrapped into my challenges with squid that I couldn't parse them apart and so I didn't have even the vocabulary to articulate what my problem was. So it drained, uh, this mindset for me drained weeks of my time as I struggled to read in a CSV file that I thought was part of my squid research and not part of a data problem. So when I talk about this with, op with the OpenScapes participants, I make it clear that data science is something that includes them. And, and that's a different idea than if you just read about data science in the news, where it's often synonymous with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. And that, and that type of definition really excludes environmental scientists who don't immediately need those tools. So instead, this is the definition we use when OpenScapes, that, op, that data science is the discipline of turning raw data into understanding. And this definition really resonates with me and with the OpenScapes participants and environmental scientists because we can see ourselves in this definition. And with this graphic, we can actually walk through the steps. So this, this graphic so clearly describes what scientists like me have been fumbling around trying to do, thinking that it's science and designing everything from scratch. So the idea that importing your data is a discrete step before tidying it as a discrete step, and then your science questions can really come into play as you try to understand your data. This is an amazing revelation. Um, the way that I had been working beforehand was to consider this entire process science and to be developing um, approaches that accommodate whatever weird format my data was in rather than thinking about it deliberately like this. So expecting that there's a better way to work and using data science as a discipline and as a tool set is part of the shifting mindset for open data science. And along with that comes building confidence and willingness to change and work a different way. So open science is a big part of developing confidence and willingness. But again, there are many different definitions of what open science is and also many even more interpretations. For many environmental scientists, I think that open science can be a pretty negative thing. It sounds like extra work and high risk for already overburdened scientists, particularly for those who are early career. And I think that that's because open science in their minds can be synonymous with sharing your data at the very end of your work, which is extra work for you. And it's not really seen as any, part of, any sort of benefit to the participant who is putting in all that time at this high risk of time and uh, this high cost of time and risk. Um, so in, this, in that mindset, open science would never really be a benefit to you. 
But so instead, with OpenScapes, we talk about how open science is the concept of transparency at all stages of the research process, coupled with free and open access to data, code, and papers. And we talk about how it's a benefit as you go to work in, with open practices so that you can collaborate with more people and, and learn together. I like the idea that open science is a spectrum with many different entry points to engage with. And I like th talking about it as a spectrum because that also helps dispel the idea that you're either doing open science or you're not. Because there's many different ways to participate and to engage from wherever you are, and then you can always engage more as you're able to. So we're, in OpenScapes, we talk about how entryways can be sharing the slides from a presentation you've given so that, the, so that what you've put so much time and effort in can live beyond that one event in that one room with that one group of people. We also practice working openly as teams with GitHub repositories, even if those repositories are private, because working openly and getting comfortable working with a team is a big step towards participating in open science more broadly. So these two things really trigger you, or trigger me, to reimagine what data science and open science can do for communication. And in environmental science, communication is something that we really value. We are, we are very similar to the open source community like R and Mozilla, because all of the work we do is for the public good, and thus communication is really critical. But for a lot of people, science communication still occurs largely at the end of their research when they're able to complete their study, have everything tidy, tidied up and ready to share. And I think that that mindset of communication just being at the end and just being one directional is rooted in the mindset that for a long time, sharing your work was really hard to do. At the end, when you were ready to share, it involved a lot of bookkeeping and formatting and physical printing in some cases of your work. And also distribution was really limited based on mail or email um, or when you actually saw people in person. But the internet provides these amazing channels to share our work, not only at the end, but throughout the entire process. And it's a way to engage with people and to get feedback and to improve. And it's critical um, that we're able to communicate throughout the whole process um, because establishing trust and action is critical for finding environmental solutions. So these are the communication tools in my mind when I talk about open data science. It's a, it's a small suite and it's based in our studio, our Git and GitHub. And keeping it so simple really streamlines how manageable it is both to do our analyses and then also uh, focus on communication because we can use the same tools for all of them. And I can share with you that I am a big curmudgeon when it comes to installing new software and creating new user accounts. I remember in one standard, um, one podcast episode of Not So Standard Deviations, Roger Pang said that if he ever has to create a new user account, he's like 50% out. And I think for me, it's like 85% out. I'm very resistant. But so anyways, having the same tools to, use my anal to do my analyses and my communication has really re helped me reimagine what communication means. And I'll show you with a few examples from the Ocean Health Index. So first of all, we put all of our code online publicly in a GitHub organization. This means that other people can discover and access and run our code and also understand what we've done and start doing assessments of their own, like I said. And GitHub repositories are really great ways to navigate and find information when you're familiar with how to navigate and find information in GitHub. But it's not a friendly landing page for everyone, so we also created a website that we can maintain ourselves still using the same tools that I mentioned before. So here, this is a new public-facing place for people to come and learn about the Ocean Health Index and then we could additionally create tutorials, blogs, a forum, share maps, results, and so many other things that really broadened how we think of communication in science. 
Um, and we are also able to then spin up lighter weight websites that will render with the data and information for whatever assessment we're talking about. So this is not only useful for us to share our work with the ocean health index assessments we lead at a global scale, but we're also able to spin these up for our colleagues working around the world using the ocean health index for their, uh, to study ocean health in their context. So another way that science communication has changed for us is that it's really easy to write nicely formatted guides and documentation to share how other people can use our tools. And we also are able to make dashboards when we're working closely with partners who really want to understand how we're engaged with data, um, how, when they're engaged with our data analysis decisions. Having the ability to create a shiny dashboard is a really powerful tool. I've also been playing with blog down so that I could more nimbly blog and share stories from OpenScapes. And then finally, another cool way you can use these tools for communication is when you decide to learn Sharingan for a keynote talk. So having open data science as a mindset is really the way we frame, we start framing the way we think in OpenScapes. But the way we start acting on all of this is through the teamwork side of things, and that starts with openness. So teams, to me, mean rings of people that you respect, innovate with, and can rely upon. It does not have to be limited to a certain deliverable, or location, or discipline, or really anything else. Teamwork is so critical in science because no one can do it all. And for the sake of innovation and for as well as emotional well-being, we really need to shed the expectation that we should be able to do it all. And instead, we need to focus on teamwork. So I've categorized teamwork here in these ways, but there are definitely a lot of blurred lines. Because actually, one of the coolest things that has been resonating with me throughout everything I've learned is how teamwork and collaboration and leadership and community all intertwine when you work openly. So open data science streamlines working with data but it also streamlines working with each other. Because having shared workflows like the Tidyverse and using GitHub mean that even when you're not working on the same project with someone else, you have the same skills and are equipped to help each other out and can have expectations about where to find things and how things work. So as an Ocean Health Index team, we're often actually not working on the same projects, but we're still able to co-develop things together we share early drafts, and we're constantly getting feedback and iterating with each other. But working openly is something that you really have to feel safe doing. So we, as an OHI team, as an Ocean Health Index team, have spent the last years building up trust with each other, and that makes us able to do our best work. This trust really centers around respecting each other, and it also centers around kindness. But on an individual level, we all had to get comfortable with sharing things before they were perfect and also being vulnerable to critique. And that does get easier when you're working in a space where you can assume the best intentions from your collaborators when they offer feedback. But this has resulted in a positive team culture where we're comfortable trying new things, we're comfortable with failure and learning from failure, and we're comfortable asking each other for help. Another thing about our team is that we prioritize social time, which is, which is obvious since it's impossible to find a, a picture when we're not at happy hour. <laughs> but um, but we, um, getting, together, getting along together well in a social context as, long as, as, as well as a work context really helps build resilience in our team and has helped avoid burnout. It also helps us develop ways um, to welcome people onto our team as students or as new collaborators, as well as when they, when they leave as well. Um, and so one of the ways that this has all started working for us is that we have created safe spaces where you could deliberately talk about data and have a shared focus for creating this kind of team culture. 
So in OpenScapes, this is what we do in our cohort calls. So these are the faces of the OpenScapes participants. They are scientists from seven different research groups in the US, and the faces you see here are the faculty or lecturers that lead the labs along with their team members who are graduate students, postdocs, technicians, uh, lab managers, and visiting faculty. So we all meet online together twice every month to discuss open data science concepts and to build community with each other. And on our calls, I try to model the behavior that I want them to pass on as well so that they can, so that they can bring this kind of positive environment back to their labs. We start off every single meeting with a code of conduct. And I said that every, um, I said that um, I designed OpenScapes to, um, okay. <laughs> What I teach in OpenScapes, I model after the Ocean Health Index. But the whole program architecture is modeled after the Mozilla Open Leaders program. This is a program that the Mozilla Science Lab and now the Open Leaders and Events team has run for, for seven different iterations, sometimes with up to six cohorts concurrently. So they've really dialed in the architecture for leading these online um, programs, and it is so awesome to be able to work with them. This includes, so the architecture includes deliberate focus on creating safe and welcoming spaces, and is focused on discussion rather than lecturing, and rather than hands-on coding. So the point is for participants to really be able to think about and reflect and discuss with each other how to bring the, the open data science practices into their own, into their own labs and having the opportunity to discuss this with other labs on these calls is a really critical part of this. So in these cohort calls, participants get more comfortable talking about open data science topics, and then their homework is to bring those conversations back to their labs. So we call these conversations seaside chats, or depending on the group, they're also called bayside or bluffside or fishbowl chats. And they're, they're essentially a specific time and place to talk about reproducible research, coding problems, cool new packages that have come out that could be relevant for their research. The seaside chats are something that the OHI, the, the, our, our Ocean Health Index team has been doing for years, in addition to our weekly science meetings that we have as a team. But seaside chats are this dedicated space to, di to discuss and develop shared systems and then start weaving open data science into our everyday work. We also have co-opted the term hackathons to use within our team. And this is where we come together and drop our own projects to focus on something that could benefit everyone, but is nobody's responsibility day to day. So for example, some of our hackathons involved upgrading our file path conventions when the HERE package came out. So some of the OpenScapes labs have done hackathons too. They've, they've focused on organizing their metadata or getting all of their R scripts online into a GitHub repository. They've also focused on documenting their shared practices in the lab so that it's easier to onboard people when they join the lab and, is, and also that it's easier to have clear methods of what people do when they offboard or leave the lab. So we covered a lot of things in our cohort calls and I'm working on capturing them all in a lesson series that could be used in any context, not specifically to environmental science. And in addition to these cohort calls, we focused a lot on leadership, both horizontal and vertical. So, this is the Ocean Health Index team, and on the left here is Ben Halpern. He's the lead of the Ocean Health Index, and he's my boss. He's played a huge role in our data science, in our open data science story, even though he's not a coder himself. And that point is really critical, because as a leader, he listened to us that we were excited about learning R, and he supported us to invest the time and, um, and gave us the resources to learn open data science. And he also trusted us that we would implement practices that would benefit our whole research group. And now, as the director of NCs, which is the ecology center where I'm based, he's making environmental data science a broader, 
um, mission and priority at NCs. And he's also spearheading a new master's program in environmental data science at the University of California in Santa Barbara. So Ben's leadership really gave us as team members agency and support to become leaders ourselves within our lab group and beyond. So on the right here is Jamie Afflerback, Ben Best, and me. And Jamie and Ben are my teammates, but they are also leaders. Ben has spent so many countless hours sitting next to me and teaching me R. And he was really patient with me when I deliberately made emails from GitHub go to my spam folder because I thought GitHub was not gonna be useful for me and I was resistant. <laughs> so Jamie is an amazing leader as well and I'll share a story about her in a second. But together the three of us have become leaders in our own right and we are partners in crime. We co-founded the Eco Data Science Study Group together and we've taught multiple carpentries workshops together. And this is us preparing for the Shiny Developers Conference in 2016. So enabling this kind of vertical and horizontal leadership around data is something that I'm really trying to ignite with OpenScapes. So these are who I call the OpenScapes champions. They are the early career faculty and lecturers that run the research groups that participate in OpenScapes. And part of the OpenScapes program, in addition to those cohort calls with all of the faces, um, is that I mentor each of these people one-on-one -on -one each month. So the idea is that I want each of them to become champions for open data science because they are an unbelievably awesome scientists and they can have oversized influence the way Ben Halpern has had with our team. So a critical thing for them to learn is that they do not need to become experts first before enabling their lab to learn and do more than, than they know. And they, can also, they also do not need to be experts before they can champion it more broadly. And this is really important because it's, it's important to release them of this expectation and also the potential anxiety that they need to master pull requests or become fluent in PER before they can expect these practices to take hold in their research groups. And this is really important because they are doing awesome science. Just in the period when uh, I was teaching with OpenScapes, they were presenting their research in front of the US Senate. They're winning awards and grants. They're teaching and they're leading field work. They are so busy and doing amazing things, and if, if we can make it easier for their labs to do well without increasing the burden on them, that's really critical. Okay, so their role in OpenScapes is to see what's possible along with their labs, and then give their labs the space and time to learn together, and then to advocate for this in their circles of influence. So they are like R2D2 and BB-8, because their role is to plug into the system and open the doors so that Luke and Ray can run through and save the day. So they really need to set the tone and encourage more horizontal leadership within their labs. And I've got a great example of this with Michelle Stewart. Um, and she's actually here. Where is she? She's right there. This is Michelle's first R conference. And she's such a leader in the Pinsky Lab. She's been spearheading their seaside chats, and she's also helped everybody in the lab learn GitHub after learning it for herself in OpenScapes. And she's also responsible for the first Our Ladies chapter in the US state of New Jersey. So this is an excellent transition to how important community is. So, let's see. Okay, so I think that the best thing I can do for OpenScapes and for the cohorts involved is to introduce them and welcome them into our communities here. So when I talk about the awesomeness of our communities with OpenScapes, it's not only to encourage them to be a part of it, but also to extend the ethos that we have in this R community to environmental science and kickstart this kind of movement there. I used to have my feet squarely in marine science in, in the communities with marine science, but now I feel like I'm bridging across environmental science communities, our communities, and Mozilla communities. And I've learned so much from each one, and I really try to help channel those lessons between the groups. 
Um, and so engaging with broader communities for me started with Twitter. So I joined Twitter to learn R because of my teammate, Jamie. And you know me, I was skeptical. I thought that Twitter was a megaphone for angry people. But she taught me that you could also use it really deliberately and listen and learn from other people. And then you can gradually build up the courage to like things and to retweet things. And she taught me that liking things and retweeting things were not only a way for you to get comfortable in the community, but it was also a way to welcome and amplify other people into the community as well. So I was amazed you could have community on Twitter, but you can. And I was also amazed that software developers are real people. <laughs> and not only that, that they're super nice people and they're people that make you feel welcomed and valued. Because prior to conversations like these, I had never stopped to think that, the, that software developers were real people. And I know that might sound crazy, but before Twitter, this was the closest I'd ever come to interacting with a software developer. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, but, but realizing that software developers went well beyond Clippy was such a defining point in my life. It was really the turning point that made me the person I am today, which is a person that will not stop talking about how awesome R is and how much the community will change your life. This is so much, this is so true that even back in 2016, my four-year-old niece knew about ggplot and dplyr. So, and I still believe this today. Um, so I encourage everyone in OpenScapes to engage with Twitter if they're comfortable, and it's cool to see them doing it from wherever they're starting from. Holly Frolic is actually, a, has quite a big following in science already, and now the fact that she tweets about open data science is so cool. It's like seeing her impact and her engagement just scale beyond anything any one person could do alone. So it's really exciting. Okay, so R and R OpenSci and R Studio have changed my life in so many ways, and I'm deliberately limiting myself to putting them on one slide because otherwise I could go on for days. But they've been so welcoming and supportive of me from well beyond, from well before I had any clue what was going on. They've created communities where developers and new users who are strangers, come together and collaborate and become friends. And there's deliberate focus and attention on setting the right space to make this happen. And that's true both online and in person at hackathons and conferences. So it's, it was a big deal to connect with our studio and our OpenSci folks online, but also in person, and to really feel a part of the community. It really, to me, solidified that I belonged here. I wasn't just a marine biologist, but I was a part of the R community. So I want OpenScapes to feel like this as well for the scientists I work with. So midway through the OpenScapes program, I was able to get the research leads together in person in California. And Sean Cross was there too. He's on the far left. He's a big, important member in our R community. And having him there with the champions was such an, a really cool experience for everyone. He helped the champions experience the awesomeness of, of the R community for themselves so that they weren't just hearing me talk about it, but they were actually able to feel it. And we also, in addition to Sean, we were able to have Christy Belay, who's a Mozilla fellow and faculty in the US, join remotely as well to talk about working openly in science. So this was a really cool event. I, I had really high expectations of it, and they, my expectations were exceeded, because the summit gave the, these scientists the opportunity not only to build trust and alliances with each other within a science context, but also within this budding open data science context. And I think that by meeting Chris, uh, Christy and Sean, they really were able to feel for themselves what I feel in this community here. So much so that Malin said that this isn't just about coding in GitHub, but this is about changing the way we do science. 
And I'm just so excited that they're feeling this for themselves because a change in mindset does not come from me talking about R all the time. It comes from them really seeing it for themselves and feeling it. So there's so many other communities that I would love to talk about and so many individual stories that are meaningful to me that I've had with individuals. But I'm not gonna get into them all here, but I am gonna talk about one more community, which is Our Ladies. So Our Ladies is changing the world. It's increasing gender diversity in the R community, but that's just the beginning. Our Ladies has given me confidence in myself, and it's made me a better advocate for women in science also. So this is something I try to pass on to OpenScapes too, and encourage them to join Our Ladies, but also carry forward the ethos of Our Ladies into their broader science communities. So the OpenScapes cohort has engaged with Our Ladies, like I mentioned, with Michelle starting her first um, New York, uh, New Jersey chapter. And they've also been engaging in existing coding clubs like our Eco Data Science in Santa Barbara and in other ones as well. And they've also created other new opportunities to code. So Allison Horst and her student Gracie started an in-person Tidy Tuesday hacky hour. And you probably recognize Allison's name because of all of the beautiful artwork in this talk. And you also might recognize her name from her awesome little R stats monsters that she posts on Twitter. But she's also a lecturer of data science and statistics at an environmental science and management master's program at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And she's also an OpenScapes champion. And one of the cool things that she did to contribute back to the community as an OpenScapes participant was that she created a website for her classes and posted all of her course materials and homeworks online. So now this is a resource not only for Allison's students, but also for anyone else who wants to learn our in, um, on their own in an environmental context. And it's also available for anybody who wants to use it to teach their own course. So these are just some of the stories of teamwork and leadership and community involvement that the OpenScapes champions have been engaged in. And there's many other examples of their awesome achievements and accomplishments and momentum. But I think you know, the intangible things are that they're really starting to shift their mindsets as individuals and their, and their culture shift is changing in the labs. And they're not only igniting this change in their laboratory groups, but they're seeding it beyond in their departments, in their campuses, and beyond. And I think it's really neat to see this interplay of how open data science and teamwork works in action. So all of these labs now have created GitHub organizations for their labs, and that provides a digital space for them to start practicing teamwork and working openly. And they've also, with their seaside chats, have a physical space where they're able to collaborate and talk about data as well. So the more I think about this, I, I realize that open data science and teamwork exist in a feedback loop that just keeps getting stronger and stronger. So learning and using similar software promotes you, it promotes and streamlines teamwork. And also working as a team better equips you to learn new practices like open science and data science. And this, this loop, I'm still thinking this through and how best to articulate and visualize it. But this loop, I think, feeds back on itself and almost becomes a spiral where it's hard to differentiate what, is, what strengths are because of teamwork and what strengths are because of open and shared practices. And I think that there's a lot of people in this room who might think that way as well because our hex stickers certainly reflect it. Our hex stickers are mixes of tools and communities and it's, it's just, yeah, I love hex stickers. Okay. <laughs> Um, so really this feedback loop, um, yeah, it's something I've been really thinking about and really how to, how to welcome scientists to this loop if they're not already engaged. And I think the best way to welcome scientists into this loop is to, I just spoiled it, harness the power of welcome. Um, so the power, so welcome is a powerful thing because it's so simple. It means being nice to people. It means being empathetic. It means being friendly. It means realizing that even though someone might be an expert in their field and doing amazing science, 
they might actually be intimidated when it comes to data science or open practices, and you welcoming them could be exactly what they need in order to engage. So I learned about this early on from the folks at our OpenSci and our studio and our ladies with their commitment to welcome and creating diverse and inclusive spaces. And this has also been a big part of my experience in education with Mozilla, and it's been a foundational part of OpenScapes. And I'm convinced it's the way to help scientists do better science in less time. So these lessons for me fuel what it means to work responsibly and collaboratively with data, but it also should fuel what it means to do science. So I'm really proud of what we've achieved with OpenScapes in the first round of champions. And I'm gonna work to, to I'm going to work to continue and develop and grow the OpenScapes program so that more cohorts can work with us every year. And I also want to begin on-demand workshops on the ground with teams. But I think we have a long way to go before this is truly the reality in science. But I'm optimistic that individual efforts can play a big role. I think the more that we talk about open data science and the more we see that it's important for environmental science, the more it will be valued and the more quickly we can change this culture as a whole and really have open data science be something that's supported within environmental science and, and taught to environmental scientists. So the awesome thing is that we all have our role to play in helping ignite this change in environmental science, but also within all of the contexts that we're coming to today or coming from today. So we can all welcome and amplify these awesome environmental scientists as they engage in our and our community so that we can all benefit from their work and from better science in less time. So thank you. Thank you so much, that was fantastic. I'm gonna switch over here so we can see the, the um, images, excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna um, talk through some questions and we can have this discussion after that fantastic keynote. Thank you so much, that was amazing. Um, so this, uh, this uh, keynote talk focused on how you um, uh, work out this, um, this open data science mindset um, in your more academic environment. Have you had discussions or um, uh, do you have recommendations for how people can put some of these things into practice in a more corporate world? I would say the horizontal leadership can come in in any context and it honestly means like being nice and open and trying to create spaces where other people can be vulnerable as well. Um, so I think that would be the, the shortest answer in any context. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, it, so in your work with um, data and working with open data, uh, has it been difficult for you to ever to open data that was closed before that did you have data that was um, that was not openly available or that was closed that um, that you had to do something to get open and were there any lessons learned that there that you could share like moving from closed to open yeah um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is so our ocean health index assessments that we do every year and that the UN is going to be using um, we use only publicly available data. Um, and that means that there's some times where there are, are not data publicly available, and so we, there's kind of this gap that we that, that exists in our work, and highlighting that gap and the need for either that data to be to be made publicly available or to be collected in the first place is is part of that. Um, I don't have any other specific close to open examples, but I think the the Ocean Health Index ha starts off with a framework so that you're, you're looking for data um, in a pretty um, deliberate way and it helps you identify gaps. Yeah. Um, so, so you deal with uh, 
you know, ocean data, ecological data. Uh, some people, you know, who are here deal with data about human beings, mm -hmm. and including people who work in tech, right? Mm -hmm. Where you deal with data mostly about human beings and cu customers and users. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have any reflections on um, or experience that is related to like uh, like ethical considerations when it comes to open data science, and, and in wanting to embrace both mm -hmm. these open practices and um, good ethical principles when it comes to uh, when it comes to handling data. Mm -hmm. So I think this is when like open science as a spectrum really plays a role because sometimes you're not able to share your data and that that and that for the, for these reasons we've just talked about and and that's okay. You can still participate by sharing your code with within a team by maybe even being able to share your code more openly if it doesn't identify things with the data. Um, but there's also, this is outside of my expertise, but there's also ways to anonymize data um, that are, so there's software options potentially as well. Yeah. But I think, yeah, the spectrum is, is the real lesson. Yeah, no, that's really great and so true. Um, here's a tough one. How? Julia, how do you deal with people who want to use Microsoft Word? I use Microsoft Word also. <laughs> um, I think that it, you know it's an interplay of uh, of tools, right? There's no one tool that's perfect for everything, and that's okay. Um, we use Google Docs a lot when we can, but Google, uh, I mean, uh, Microsoft Word is still really great for track changes and for collaborators. Um, so there's been times where we'll write our, some papers in our markdown and still export to Word so that we can get uh, all collaborators to contribute. So it's not like a, yeah, it's not, it's not a, a one-stop shop by any means. Yeah, 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 that's, even my experience in the business world as well, uh, you know, it's not like all or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, working as you do in, in the, in the context you do, do you run into colleagues who are interested in um, uh, uh, using Python or and like doing mm -hmm. cross language collaboration? Um, do you have people who work with multiple languages in your group? How do you manage that? Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you uh, manage those sort of priorities? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's a great question. So. Especially with OpenScapes, like I, I actually don't want that to only be an R um, program. It's just that R is my only expertise, and so that's where we're starting from. But in it, I try to describe most of the things we talk about are actually not necessarily R specific, except for the R community and a lot of the okay, and a lot of the packages we talk about. But um, <laughs> but I, that's where we're starting from. Um, but I do try to show that like reticulate is a way that you can work with. In, in between Python and R within the same shared context in RStudio. Um, yeah, I, I mean, R is, has been my entry point, and it's an amazing tool and community, but I'm not trying to exclude Python people from, from these practices at all. Yeah, and I mean, so many of these practices you talk about apply to both, yeah, right? Yeah, and, yeah. To, and beyond, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's another there's another question specifically about privacy issues. We talked a little about it a little bit. Um, I guess I guess we did not specifically ask. Do you deal with any privacy issues in your work? So we actually don't. We work with publicly available data, um, and then so we're we're not serving it or managing it at all. So we're we're working with publicly available data, and so we're in this context able to share our our code more um, broadly. We do, however, some of the 20 independent groups that I mentioned are working with government data that is not publicly available. And for them, they still use our code and our packages um, to work with their data, but they are pointing to a closed server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so, and like you said, there's this spectrum that allows you to engage with many of these practices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as you, <clears throat> Embrace using R in ecology. Um, what would you, and you reflect back? What would you say was the hardest barrier as you moved into these these open science science practices and using R? What was um, what was the perhaps the hardest barrier mm -hmm. for you? Um, I think the imperfection part was the hardest for me. Like I I really like 
getting things perfect. And that's just something that, um, I don't know, Ed, we, something we say with our Ocean Health Index team is to not let perfect be the enemy of the good. So when things are good enough to share internally or beyond, like it's, it's good to share your imperfect work because always you'll have more, or most often more heads or more eyeballs on a problem will make it better. So, but personally for me to sort of become more comfortable um, sharing imperfect things and then incorporating feedback. But it's also been one of the things that's been like the most rewarding because I'm able to get such great feedback from so many people. Yeah, that directly relates to another question is here, is that this approach, this open, like working openly, putting work um, on GitHub uh, approaches or requires quite a bit of trust, someone is saying. Mm -hmm. um, and how, what allowed you to um, embrace this system um, knowing that it might lead you to being scooped mm -hmm. or it might lead uh, researchers to being scooped for results? Um, and uh, particularly, uh, the, uh, this impact may be felt more broadly for early career mm -hmm. scientists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what, uh, what have been the experience of you mm -hmm. and the other people you work with mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to this idea of um, uh, working openly in a world where like, people consider that a risk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think focusing on, um, I think there is this tend towards focusing on being scooped or on like kind of the, the, the hand, they're, they're big deals and they're real, but the sort of handful of risks involved and you don't think about the suite of benefits you get. So. I think um, the benefits of being able to not do bookkeeping yourself, but let GitHub and Git do that, and not have to be forwarding emails to people and downloading things, but instead knowing where they are online, like I think the benefits of that so much outweigh the risk. But at the same time, you, like because this is a spectrum, like if if your data being scooped is your biggest worry, don't start there. You do not need to start there. You can start by sharing your code online with your group or, um, or, or beyond. But I think that like, I think really um, the idea that open science means being scooped and it means people stealing your data is, is this mindset that we have to move away from because there's so many other ways to benefit from open science and from the broader community than just focusing on those. Yeah. Um, so some of the people who are here feel like in their in their research areas there is a um, a, a a movement or a push towards um, uh, funding from corporations, a patent oriented research, um, and that that can be hard to hold that uh, that set of values at the same time as the um, this open science mindset. Have you run into people who work in those kinds of areas or who have had to uh, run into that kind of balance? I, I, actually, that's not really my area, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, as I, so I do work in tech okay. um, uh, myself, and I, um, not in an area that's like patent or, oriented, but um, as I was reflecting on your talk, I, I thought some of the things that I d directly could apply certainly were um, um, uh, that, that th thinking about like the mindset, that, that there were so, so many things that were directly applicable, like the, um, uh, do I expect to be able to learn to do things in a new and better way? Do I, um, do I think about uh, how I'm building leadership in my team? So I think, I think that that might be a thing we could take to those perhaps different kinds of environments. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, so this, this is kind of a big question, but I'm, I'm interested if your, your process, your experiences that you've had maybe with um, our OpenSci or these other organizations have given you maybe ideas here. Um, this, so journals um, are kind of a mess, maybe people have noticed, um, like peer review, peer review process um, it can be difficult. Uh, what, uh, do, you, do you have ideas or have you had experience about peer review, peer review, peer review for code mm -hmm. or especially code for science mm -hmm. um, uh, using GitHub or other mm -hmm. uh, tools like that? Um, yeah, we, um, we actually, my colleague Melanie um, participated in a, 
our OpenSci community call about code review to talk about how we do it with the Ocean Health Index. Um, we internally as our team, but also but it but it's all public. Uh, we try to review all of the code that we do within our team, um, and then as we um, bring graduate students into our work, we do the same process of code review with them. So it involves you know going line by line together um, quite often and iterating off of that. Um, but I'd also say um, you mentioned publication before, and just to put a, a plug in for what. Um, uh, uh, peer review can look like. My, uh, one of my colleagues, my Mozilla fellow, um, fellow um, Daniela Sadari, has started a group called Pre-Review that's really trying to take this open leaders and cohort-based approach to peer review um, so that you can actually get more voices, more early career expertise um, in a community setting for peer review. So yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah, that is that sounds really exciting. Um, uh, so some of these are again a little bit of. Actually, I'm not going to do some of these because they're a little similar to what we've done before. But in in the interest of talking mm -hmm. about a different topic, do you see a difference between open science mm -hmm. and open data science? Yeah, it's, you know, word choice is really hard. <laughs> um, I, I do see a difference for me for between open science and open data science, or maybe it's just a refinement within it. Um, I think, you know, I think open data science really focuses on the kind of ecosystem of tools that I mentioned focused around R and GitHub, whereas open science is much more broad, including publication and, um, data management and and uh, much more broad context. Okay. Nice. All right. So we're going to we're going to end with one last question. Okay. Um, which of the Star Wars movies in your opinion is the best? I'd say Empire Strikes Back. A good answer. A good answer. <laughs> <laughs>